This conference will now be recorded. Welcome. My name is Ellen Senft, and I'm the PHN Manager for Disaster and Emergency Coordination. I'm pleased to welcome our speakers for tonight, Katie Sewell and Mitch Parker from New South Wales Reconstruction Authority, Andrew Elms from New South Wales Police, David Rankin from State Emergency Service, and Professor Graham Brewer from Newcastle University. This event is delivered to you in a cooperation between New South Wales Reconstruction Authority and the PHN. With us is also Phoebe James, who assists the facilitation of this event. All slides and a virtual goodie bag containing helpful resources that may assist your practice in navigating through the disaster management cycle will be sent to you after this event. Before we get started, I will hand over to John Bailey, Executive Manager Primary Care Improvement at the PHN, for a welcome and acknowledgement of country. Thanks, Ellen, and welcome, everyone. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that form our region, the ancestors and elders past and present. We acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the first Australia's first peoples and their unique culture and spiritual relationship to the land, waters and sea and their rich contribution to society. Always was, always will be First Nations lands. Uh, can I welcome everyone tonight? Unfortunately, I can't stay. I have to join another meeting, uh, but I'm sure that uh, this evening you will uh, be able to share your experiences and your learnings. And uh, I'm hopeful that this will be one of a number of these events that we'll be able to uh, conduct over the region in the coming months, if not years. So have a good evening and enjoy. Thanks, back to you. I think, sorry, no, I'm throwing to Mitch Parker. So Mitch, over to you. Thanks, John. So yeah, good, uh, good evening, everyone. So my name is Mitch Parker. I'm the manager for the New England Northwest with the uh, New South Wales Reconstruction Authority. I'm based here in Tamworth. So the New South Wales Reconstruction Authority was established in December 2022 after acknowledgement of ongoing disasters and uh, effect of natural hazards upon communities in New South Wales. Uh, predominantly, the focus of our legislative comment agencies, the emergency services, was to prepare uh, for and respond to these events. However, uh, either ends of the scales uh, within the emergency management framework needed uh, more investment. Essentially, what the, uh, the New South Wales Reconstruction Authority are, or as we are known as the RA, uh, will improve how New South Wales plans for disasters and ensures the communities across the state recover from them uh, faster. Uh, we also are involved in reducing, assisting in the re reduction of impacted disasters and the RA uh, complete critical planning and preparation with communities, businesses and other government uh, and non-government entities uh, in that space. So when disasters uh, do occur, uh, the Reconstruction Authority uh, will, will work with recovery uh, processes more swiftly and, and coordinate reconstruction efforts uh, across the government, communities and other stakeholders. The authority uh, leads four key disaster functions. Uh, that is planning, mitigation and adaptation, local preparedness, community-centred recovery, long-term building and reconstruction. The RA uh, is designed to be there long before a disaster and work, uh, work with the communities on recovery and reconstruction long after the disaster has passed. It's not something that we have seen uh, previously uh, to this extent, um, primarily learning from similar models used in Queensland, such as the Queensland Reconstruction Authority. So it's uh, it's really positive to see that government has identified this and really investing into the, uh, the bookends of the uh, disaster uh, management framework. So that's a brief overview of uh, the New South Wales Reconstruction Authority uh, disaster and how we work with our communities and other agencies to, to uh, in that space. What I will throw to is uh, Andrew Elms from the New South Wales Police Force in the emergency management section to give us a rundown on 
the emergency management arrangements for different specific portfolios. Uh, Andrew. Thanks for that, Mitch. Appreciate that. Um, welcome, everybody. As uh, Mitch said, I'm just going to give a quick overview of the uh, New South Wales emergency management arrangements. Uh, I'd also just like to acknowledge Andrew Codrington, who is my colleague, Regional Emergency Management Officer for the Hunter and Central Coast. Uh, welcome, Andrew. So, uh, as it says there on the screen, I'm the Substantive Regional Emergency Management Officer, or REMO, for the Central West South. Uh, substantively, my patch is Bathurst Orange, Lithgow, across to Parks, Forbes and Condobolin. I'm currently looking after the New England region. Uh, the uh, Remo for New England has been on long-term leave and I'm very happy to say they interviewed for his position this morning. So hopefully New England will get its, its own Remo back in the not too distant future. So what are the emergency management arrangements in New South Wales? The overarching legislation uh, in relation to emergency management is the State Emergency and Rescue Management Act 1989 or the CIRM Act as everyone refers to it. The CIRM Act prescribes that there will be a State Emergency Management Plan or M Plan, like everything else emergency management loves acronyms. So there'll be a State Emergency Management Plan. That State M Plan is a strategic level document, uh, provides a lot of uh, advice in relation to combat agencies, supporting agencies. Under the M plan, there are a number of sub plans. Sub plans relate to specific hazards. Um, there's a bushfire sub plan, a flood sub plan, uh, and then there are supporting plans. And the supporting plans are those which belong to functional areas. Um, under M plan functional areas support combat agencies. Combat agencies are those who the plan gives specific responsibility to for specific emergencies. Uh, hazardous materials, for instance, M plan prescribes that the combat agency for that is Fire and Rescue New South Wales. Storms, tempest, floods, tsunamis, the combat agency for those is the State Emergency Service. So identifies combat agencies, M-Plan identifies functional areas who will support the combat agencies. As you can see there, with everything we have in emergency management, what occurs at a state level is replicated at region and local levels. Each region, and we have uh, 18 uh, remos across the state who look after various emergency management regions, and that's what we're talking about, emergency management regions. Each region has its own M plan. And then every local government area, which will have its own local emergency management committee, and I'll talk about them next, they have their own M plans as well. Those local M plans are very specific for that local government area. Uh, they provide the advice of, of what to do when there's an emergency there. And they have associated documents called consequence management guides, which will provide additional advice for specific risks that have been identified. As I mentioned, at uh, local government level, we have local emergency management committees. Each LGA has its own LEMC, and then each LGA will have its own local emergency management officer. The local emergency management officer uh, will be somebody who's employed by the local council. Often the LEMO role is, uh, congratulations, you're the new Director of Infrastructure, and by the way, you're the LEMO as well. So there are one or two councils that have uh, dedicated LEMOs, uh, but there will always be somebody from the council who is appointed as the LEMO. The Local Emergency Management Committee is convened and exercises its functions under the provisions of the CIRM Act. Um, as any of you have had anything to do with local government, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of ownership of, of anything local governments do. However, the Local Emergency Management Committee is convened under that CIRM Act, not the Local Government Act. So it's a bit of an odd creature. Uh, council runs it, but it's not part of council. So any decisions that are made at LEMC meetings don't have to be signed off by council. They're, they're made in-house. Normally, the general manager of the uh, local government area is the chair of the Local Emergency Management Committee. Uh, however, that role is often delegated to the LEMO. 
and the primary role of the local emergency committee is planning. So on the graphic there at the moment, you can see uh, what we call the comprehensive approach to emergency management. Uh, four areas are prevention, preparedness, response and recovery. And certainly the focus tonight, we're looking at recovery and they just are a continuous cycle. The local emergency management committee is planning for all of those things. And the local emergency management committee is probably the most important level because that's the level where we need to be, build resilience, uh, build relationships, uh, engage your stakeholders. And that's where we, uh, that's where disasters happen. That's where emergencies happen. They happen at that local level. So the focus is there and it's really important that they function really quite well. Our role as a, as a REMO is, uh, although we work for the police, we pro provide a lot of support to LEMCs, um, anything to do with emergency management. Another uh, role that's prescribed under the State Emergency Rescue Management Act is the Local Emergency Operations Controller. And for another acronym, let's call that person the LEACON. The LEACON will always be a police officer. They're appointed by the region commander who is in the role of the Regional Emergency Operations Controller or REACON. The LEACON will be responsible for establishing an emergency operations uh, centre if one is required. You can imagine recently as an example in the floods uh, throughout New England, uh, SES were the combat agency, but there was a lot of support being provided to SES. That support is provided generally through the Emergency Operations Centre. And again, they are established at a local, regional or state level. Uh, probably the most uh, recognisable state level Emergency Operations Centre of recent times was for COVID. Uh, the LEACON will get everyone that's needed together in that room and they'll be representatives of those functional areas I spoke about before, who provide support to the combat agencies. Um, an example would be uh, down in my patch uh, at the end of last year, we had a uh, very interesting gas emergency. The natural gas supply was disrupted to 20,000 customers in Bathurst, Lithgow and Oberon. And one of the emergency measures was the installation of a large uh, 40 tonne natural gas cylinder. There had to be a certain amount of groundworks done to prepare that. And that was done by the uh, engineering services functional area. So um, the LEACON had those people in the room. They worked with the uh, owners of the pipeline, the people who were providing the uh, the cylinder, and they, they had the, the works done. So the LEACON oversees and coordinates support through the Emergency Operations Centre. There are also a number of responsibilities that are legislated uh, under the CERM Act for the LEACON. Uh, including, if, if needs be, and the combat agency has requested it, the LEACON can actually take over uh, as the uh, person in charge of the emergency. Uh, all of our LEACONs are required to undergo a minimum amount of training to be a LEACON in the role, and many of them are very, very experienced. Um, when they're doing the LEACON role, they take their police hat off and they wear their LEACON hat. So in an EAC, you'll often see the LEACON, but there'll be other police as well who are doing the police role, whilst the police officer who's doing the uh, LEACON role is focusing on that role. Last thing that uh, I was asked to give a quick overview on was just uh, evacuation centres. Uh, obviously, events like floods and bushfires, uh, there, there may be a need to evacuate residents and there needs to be a coordination of that evacuation. Uh, typically, an evacuation centre is opened at the request of the combat agency. And again, the LEACOM will coordinate the opening of the evacuation centre and the management of the evacuation centre. They'll uh, delegate responsibility for managing those to welfare services functional area. The welfare services functional area belongs to the Department of Communities and Justice. However, they may be supported by other functional areas or other supporting agencies. For example, we have a system called uh, Register, Find, Reunite. And when people present to an evacuation centre, they will register. Uh, their details will be kept in a uh, database. That will be managed by the Red Cross on behalf of 
uh, welfare services and the Leocon. And if I'm overseas and I'm really concerned about my my nearest and dearest, and I know that I'm looking at the news and see there's an emergency, I can get in touch and and get some basic information to say yes, that person has registered, they are safe, we know where they are. So those evacuation centres. Ideally, we don't accommodate people in evacuation centres. The ideal situation would be for WELFAC, uh, Welfare Services Functional Area Coordinator, to register those people and find them accommodation elsewhere. We do end up occasionally, uh, depending on the circumstances, uh, where an evacuation centre will house people, but it's not the ideal situation. Most often, and certainly in much of the flooding events we had through New England, Anyone who was evacuated was normally evacuated to a, after registering at the evacuation centre, was evacuated to a motel and they were provided commercial accommodation. Uh, the people who are evacuated don't have to pay for that. Uh, one of the uh, simple things to do though was at that evacuation centre, that's where everyone came to have their food. So all of the meals were provided there, breakfast, lunch and dinner. Um, everyone came back for meals and went back to their accommodation. Uh, there may be other agencies involved. One of the things that people will always want to take with them when they're evacuated is their uh, companion animals. And one of the functional areas is the agricultural and animal services functional area. Responsibility for that rests with the Department of Primary Industries. And uh, generally speaking, the aim is to have those animals as close as you can to the evacuation centre so their owners can keep an eye on them. Um, Sometimes we can't do that. Larger animals like horses have to be uh, accommodated uh, often at showgrounds and places like that where there's more appropriate facilities for them. But the idea is that as much as possible, people and their companion animals can be uh, housed within the same area. And I'm led to believe by ASFA that there are some quite odd animals that often turn up at these places. So um, I'm impressed by the work that those people do. So those are those functional areas that support the operation of an evacuation centre. Evacuation centre is different to a recovery centre, and I'm sure Katie will talk more about that shortly. But um, that's a really brief overview of the uh, emergency management arrangements in New South Wales. Uh, our emergency management arrangements in New South Wales are tried and tested. Um, as I said recently, we had a gas emergency in Bathurst, which was was really out there, nobody expected, and it was an exemplar of how well our emergency management in New South Wales, uh, emergency management arrangements in New South Wales work. So uh, happy to take any questions in question time, um, but that's a really high level overview of our emergency management arrangements. And that's me done, and I'm handing over to Ellen. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. First of all, um, this group would also like to acknowledge all people recovering from disasters, um, their lived experience and pain and the discomfort they experience. And the group, we all express hope that what we discuss today will help people affected by disasters. Disasters inherently affect the healthcare sector and they have public health implications due to the human dimensions of disasters. They have widespread systemic effects which cause multi-sectoral losses. Enhanced preparedness is vital for an effective response. Preparedness can be built on an organization or business level or on the patient level. So, for your business, it's important that you think about developing a business continuity plan, that you test run it and you review it regularly. And you might also want to have a practice emergency plan, just depends on in what risk area your practice is. On a patient level, it might be important for you to know how to quickly identify at risk priority patients for example, by using your practice management software um, to see which patients would be particularly vulnerable during an event. You might also be asked by distressed patients to provide resources for at-risk patients and their carers to develop preparedness. 
for example, disability inclusive disaster risk reduction or person centered emergency preparedness. And for at risk patients with chronic diseases, you may want to tailor the chronic disease management plan to safeguard an organized approach to care and access to their medication during an event. Coming back to the organization and business level preparedness, there is a tool called the ERPT tool developed by the RACGP. It's not for free, but it allows you to develop a business continuity plan in a multi-hazards approach. And um, it's accredited by RACGP. So many GPs already use it. If you're interested, have a look at it. We will also disseminate the link of this resource in our goodie bag after the event. And we will have some events coming up soon about disaster preparedness for health providers. They will be um, running in winter, so that will be announced soon. The response to a disaster is a multi-agency response, as Andrew mentioned, and all health services may contribute. On an organization or business level, it's of course very important that you follow advice of first responding agencies that you evacuate when you're told to evacuate and um, give that information on to your um, staff as well. And we are always there for you, inform the PHN if you or your business are affected by a disaster event and we will do our best to connect you to the relative stakeholders and to help you out. If you're interested, you might also want to join the PHN Emergency Register to assist the local disaster response. This is a register of interested practitioners and GPs community practices who want to assist the emergency response in their own practice or in a potential evacuation center. On a patient level, during response phases, you might want to temporarily create surge capacity for disaster affected patients if it's possible, for example, through triaging or offering telehealth. During the recovery phase, patients may seek you and your help to address secondary disaster effects that often only manifest months after the event for example, mental health issues occurring. Services New South Wales Disaster Assist is available for patients, but also for you as a business. And um, disaster affected people and patients can also attend recovery assistance points held in affected communities. And if you want to create external search capacity for patients because your business is already overwhelmed. There are different options. We have them listed on our resource um, link we will send out to you. Um, for example, telehealth providers, additional mental health providers, for example, Rural Health Connect as an example for one of these providers. Um, we also provide you with other mental health resources in our goodie bag, um, the New South Wales Reconstruction Authority list, for example. Then available is always the Health Pathways platform, which is a provider facing um, information platform, or for patients, the patient info platform. Both of them are created by the LHD in collaboration with the PHN. On an organization and business level, recovery might um, be important for you and your staff to contact Services New South Wales and the PHN for assistance if you're affected. And you can use the New South Wales Reconstruction Authority resource list as well. But sometimes even the best um, are overwhelmed by everything happening. So you have the opportunity to access the PHN Employees Assistance Program um, or other mental health resources for responders that are also listed on our resource list. In the planning and prevention phase, we want to incorporate the lessons learned into our business continuity plan. So update it accordingly, look what worked, what didn't work, what could we work on to improve in the future. 
We want to anticipate and assess threats to be able to react differently and incorporate the lessons learned. And by doing so, we reduce our risk and our vulnerability. While we often can't prevent hazards from occurring, for example, climate related hazards, we can change our approach towards pre-event planning and preparation to increase our capability and reduce our vulnerability. It's important to note that disaster impacts are determined by human action or a lack thereof. And in our planning phase, we may ask ourselves, what creates my individual risk and what can reduce this risk? So I will now hand over to Katie Sewell, who will dig deeper into disaster recovery with us. Thank you. Just checking, you can see my screen. Yeah, all good. Fantastic. Um, so I'll be talking more specifically around the New England Northwest um, 2022 floods and the recovery work um, that we led there in the community. And my slides are not sliding. Oh, there we go. So I'll just start with um, looking at the, the National Principles for Disaster Recovery. And the Australian Institute for Disaster Resilience, ADA, has established six um, national principles for the disaster recovery, which are incorporated into New South Wales recovery planning. So for successful recovery, the next six steps um, uh, look towards um, the, sorry, the recovery work um, that we all should be engaging in. And so for successful recovery is based on an understanding of the community context with each community having its own history, values and dynamics. It, um, it is responsive to the complex and dynamic nature of both emergencies and the community. Um, using community led approaches um, is community centred, responsive and flexible, engaging with community and supporting them to move forward and coordinate all activities, um, requires a planned, coordinated and adaptive approach between community and partner agencies based on continu continuing assessment of impacts and needs. Communicate effectively is built on effective communication between the affected community and all the partners and acknowledgement and acknowledge and build capacity recognises, supports and builds on individuals, communities and organisational capacity and resilience. Um, in the New England Northwest recovery, flood recovery um, last year, we and currently, we saw uh, multiple LGAs impacted. And sometimes when um, we see a larger scale um, disaster, um, we see the establishment of a regional recovery committee. So at the local um, level, we see a local recovery committee established and under that a number of subcommittees and the health and wellbeing is one of those subcommittees. So um, what we saw, and I'll be talking about Gunnedah Flood Recovery Health and Wellbeing Working Group, as well as the Regional Flood Recovery Health and Wellbeing Group. But just before I do that, just because the membership is quite shared across both the working groups, and I won't read them all out, but you, you will see the, the different types of members that we had there. And although um, we've got NGOs as one small little, um, appears here as a small stakeholder, they played a significant role. Um, in that in those recovery um, working groups as well as bringing that into that local intel um, to the front. So the Gunnedah flood recovery health and wellbeing meeting met 16 um, times and the focus of those groups of those meetings was to look at the impact data which actually informed um, our natural disaster declarations and the different types of um, state and national funding grants that might be um, announced. The recovery assistant points also known as recovery centres, um, any of the funding announcements, the comm strategy which is really important and identifying those needs and gaps that have arisen from the recovery work and engage new key stakeholders that weren't engaged from the beginning of the recovery and as we identify needs as we move through. Um, the Regional um, Health and Wellbeing Working Group um, had met at a total of 10 meetings and very similar um, focus, although the focus also tend to be um, at the business level and addressing it across the three LGAs in the one instance, 
and um, and it was about sharing those key stake um, resources across the different um, councils as well. Um, a recovery assistant point, so a recovery centre, in essence, and enables affected um, people to hold a one-to-one -one conversation with recovery agencies to provide financial assistance and advice. And this, um, I guess, is a model that um, assists people, particularly if communications are down, um, they feel overwhelmed, they don't know where to start. Um, just to be able to have that face-to-face -face engagement is really helpful. Um, and we do bring a range of services um, to that space. And if you can see the screen big enough on your screen, you'll see the inside the Gunnadar recovery assistant point. Um, so we do talk about, we have services for um, that address housing issues, support, personal support, mental health, um, insurance inquiries, including legal aid, farming assistance and business support. And I thought um, the group here tonight might be interested in um, the amount of recovery system points we did hold in total across, across those three LGAs um, was 27. And that um, was a direct result of those local recovery health and wellbeing working groups that identified those needs and identified the locations. And in total, we saw around 600 and, uh, 760 people um, register and they may be repeat people who had to come back and um, provide additional um, evidence. Um, so in terms of the phases of disaster, um, and I just thought, you know, there's two ways of looking at this, you know, I guess in my role and how I have to describe the work that we do in a coordinated recovery. And that's, I guess, what um, Andrew Elms is talking about as well um, in, the, in the work that we do. But we're very mindful, you know, the, the patient journey or the community member or the impacted person um, has quite a different journey to what I'm about to show um, around the way that we work in, in the remits that we have. So just thinking about um, just above the line here, that not everybody, um, every journey, sorry, is very unique and that some stages can be skipped. Um, so as you can imagine, obviously being pre um, a disaster, but then as the warnings are coming through or evacuation order, uh, warnings or evacuation centres are announced, um, the, the onset of the impact. And then as we, as you probably well aware, as we see, as we increase, um, we start to see people helping out and cleaning up and wanting to donate and wanting to volunteer. And then we see, um, I guess, at the, the peak of it, then this rapid decline when services tend to, the cleaning ups happened and people have moved on and or there might be another neighbouring um, LGA that's been impacted. So, um, and, and then as we you see the ups and downs around trigger events or other um, triggers that may occur. And then, um, and as you see that the end reconstruction um, phase, I guess, is that new beginning, but where life may be better um, in a better, I guess, control situation than where they were before the flood. And they may have lived in a flood zone, but continue to live in a flood zone. And what is it in between that they've been able to learn and to adapt? So in terms of the health and wellbeing um, work that we do in recovery, um, we look at it in different phases. So one is the, the relief and short-term recovery, which is the hours to weeks. And as you can imagine a bit what Andrew talked about in the evacuation centre, but then it, it very quickly ticks over to recovery. And so we are still looking at that safety, shelter, security, um, physical, psychological wellbeing. And it's a very short um, phase there, as you can see, as the impact um, occurs. Then we look at the long, the medium to long term recovery and months to years, and this directly um, starts to uh, talk to different agencies in different ways and around the work that they do during an emergency um, recovery phase, but also their business as usual. And then moving into that transitional piece um, where it is business as usual for the community. So the work that we saw in terms of the um, recovery system points, the recovery centres occurred um, and they've now finalised because the numbers had um, and the attendance had um, winded down quite low, um, that we saw that this is around the phase. And so you see the impact and as things are, people are still quite heroic and things are, people are helping each other, um, less and less people were attending the, the centres for assistance. The Health and Wellbeing Working Group was established immediately once the response handed over to recovery. Um, this is where we just determined what kind of assistance and support was required based on the impact and where would the centres need to be placed and what agencies we needed to attend. Um, we continue to meet as you saw those meeting um, uh, numbers and then we continue to meet and then 
we then look at um, that transition and it's the work that's done in the health and wellbeing working group um, where it's local providers, state and our Commonwealth partners where um, some of the, the issues that had come up in the recovery phase is taken forward and that includes some of the issues that have been highlighted particularly in the mental health suicide prevention area on, in Gunnedah. Um, we're talking with key stakeholders and making sure that there is capacity and there's outreach in those areas. And I guess uh, for primary practices, uh, the, the thinking would be, you know, what role could you play and in what phase um, could you engage with a patient around disaster um, recovery? So it actually could be the before, as Ellen talked about, the prepare, the, the planning, I guess, and the preparedness, um, or is it during resharing information around evacuation orders and hoping people may evacuate earlier so we're not needing to go and rescue people, um, where there is an evacuation centre to reshare that as a trusted voice um, in community and so on, and just being able to check in on patients at different phases and just seeing how they're going. Um, the last slide that I wanted to um, talk about is on what are some practical things that can um, a private um, primary healthcare pr um, provider do. Um, and I've just broken it down into what lead agencies. It can be very overwhelming to Google and, and understand where, who's who in the zoo. Um, so this is a very simple way to um, navigate the system. So I've got the lead agencies to as source of truth and then I've got what to look for, what you can print and what you can share. So Services New South Wales, which is Ellen did talk about, um, there is a, ver a variety of um, uh, services that they provide, but they are the service where people go and register the impact and they have that assessment of what their needs are. Um, you can print resources from there and you can share or create a newsletter or send that out through um, your patient network. Um, the Reconstruction Authority, our role is we use the social media but at a statewide level. Um, we use Facebook and LinkedIn and we actually create the social tiles that promote the recovery assistant points or centres and they can be reshared if you're using social media. Council are our other source of truth at a local level. Um, we do wrap around our councils to make sure that information is funneled through the councils and that includes websites. But again, you can either reshare, they reshare our um, tiles, but you can also share theirs um, or encourage people to go to council to go and receive the updates if they can't access the internet um, or social media. Um, and at a local practice, um, uh, level, what to look for is, you know, your own relevant health information that Ellen's already touched on, but also creating a sign can be really effective in, in the um, practice that says, let the doctor know if you've been impacted by the disaster. Um, the doctor could have one in, in his office or their office, her office, and says the same thing, you know, just have you been impacted? Um, you can print copies of the goodie bag that Ellen has also talked about that would be available and you can print you know, um, ahead of time, I guess, create some packs that can be handed out and provided. Um, so I will now, it's the end of my presentation, and I will hand over to David Rankin from the State of Emergency Service. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for your time this evening in joining us uh, for this webinar. My name is David Rankin. Um, I am the Community Engagement Manager for the New South Wales State Emergency Service for all of Western New South Wales. That is a, a territory at the moment that spans from Tenerfield in northeast New South Wales through to Tibbaburra, Broken Hill and down to the Victorian border um, in western, southwestern New South Wales. So effectively 62% of the state. Um, as this slide suggests, for us it was a particularly busy period of flooding uh, during the past 18 months. Um, for us, I, I won't read off the screen, but you can see there, we were in flood for more than 400 days continually over the course of late 2021 to 2023, which, which uh, resulted in more than 30,000 requests for assistance and 11 evac evacuated communities. Now, from the perspective of our evacuation, uh, they included um, the community of Gunnedah or no less than six times in a very short period, uh, the communities of Moree and um, also five First Nations villages along the Bow and Darling system. Um, amongst those 30,000 requests for assistance were a large number of resupply jobs. And interestingly, um, from a primary health network perspective of those 1,900 resupply, close to 30% of the resupply was for medication for people and communities that were long-term isolated um, 
the likes of Wee War and Warren in Western New South Wales saw isolation periods of up to three months. But we also saw pastoralists in far Western New South Wales along the Darling system, in some cases, uh, isolated for up to five to six months. And um, the SES during that particular period of time um, engaged helicopters to both deliver medical supplies to um, those isolated uh, residents, mostly diabetes, asthma, and some oncology drugs, um, um, oral oral um, chemotherapy drugs were quite were common in that sense. We also um, we also used our helicopter resources during that event to bring a number of isolated people back into communities for particularly oncology appointments and specialist appointments to manage ongoing and um, lingering medical conditions. From a primary health network perspective and one of the lessons learnt from us is to reach out earlier to doctors in local communities to ensure we have a better understanding of their patient needs and particularly patients who may be isolated to better assist with the delivery of prescriptions. And that's certainly a lesson learnt from our perspective and um, we, something we'll be continuing to implement in the, uh, the health network spaces in our role as the primary combat role for, uh, for flooding. Look, what that meant for us being so busy was um, an extreme stretch of all of our resources. Uh, the logistical issues around um, resupply and also evacuation are obviously immense. And we acknowledge that there is a lot of mental health um, issues around not only the evacuation, <coughs> excuse me, but also long-term isolation. Um, we were in fact flying in some instances, uh, mental health experts out to properties where it was identified that perhaps um, there were some issues with both long-term trauma um, from the prolonged isolation and also some community members who um, had been evacuated on more than one occasion. Um, to give you an idea of some of the impact of flooding, this is a flood uh, map, a peak height map for Gunnedah between September and November of last year. And as you can see in a number of, uh, in a very short period of time between the end of September in the beginning of or the middle of November, we saw no fewer than six um, major peaks in that community, uh, creating a lot of infrastructure issues in terms of evacuation um, and a lot of uh, infrastructure issues around the idea of resupply and, um, and making sure that those residents who were evacuated were adequately housed. Um, it's been a very, it was a, obviously a very busy period for that particular community, but we saw now, no fewer than, as I said, 11 or 12 communities evacuated during that, um, the bulk of the flooding, which took place between September and November last year, along a two and a half thousand kilometre stretch of river between Tenerfield and, um, and Wentworth in southwestern uh, New South Wales. Um, I always love this quote, when we work in the, the flood recovery and also response phase, um, and as an organisation, we have now begun the process of working with communities uh, to understand and better assist them in the delivery of service in future events. Um, that process commenced in Gunnedah two weeks ago, where we had a large number of community members uh, join us for a flood forum um, and the report on our service delivery and improvements to that service delivery will be ready at the beginning of next month. Um, included in that were a number of local healthcare professionals, uh, both GPs and some nurses from the hospital who provided some tremendous insight for us on the improvement of delivery of support services for uh, medical professionals. Um, those flood forums are being rolled out in the next two months between uh, Moree, Walgett, uh, Burke, Brewarrina, uh, Menindee, and also Wentworth, and also through Central Western New South Wales, the likes of Yagara, Canoundra, Molong, and Kidal. So we are now working in alongside a number of our fantastic partners. We've had a very close working relationship with Reconstruction Authority, and we are very much looking forward to continuing that relationship. But we will encourage all in all of the flood forums that we're undertaking in the next uh, few months, that um, 
we encourage medical professionals to come along to see how the particular needs of their communities, every community has different needs, and we are more than happy to work with them to improve that service delivery in future flood events as the combat agency. Um, the one thing we certainly work through um, the process and you'll find it in the goodie bag was the delivery of service to First Nations and remote communities along the Barwon Darling system, uh, where we saw out of area community members, particularly volunteers coming from the East Coast and metropolitan areas and working with isolated and remote uh, First Nations communities. And you'll find, as I said in the goodie bag, um, a list of uh, suggested engagement techniques to when dealing and working with First Nations communities. We also found that that resource was particularly effective for new medical professionals, locums, um, young doctors and nurses who are coming into community um, and have not had the experience of working particularly with First Nations community members. There was just um, a fantastic resource for them also to uh, when they're out doing some community work uh, from a medical health perspective during the flooding, that they just some ideas about the cultural appropriateness of engagement with those communities. So that is in the um, that is in the document goodie bag, which you'll get at the end of this event. Um, anyone, any doctor or medical health professional on this is welcome to contact me about their specific community needs and things that they think the SES can do to assist them in the greater. And my details are there. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity this evening to, to come on and have a listen to us. Uh, have a listen to this great webinar. Um, and uh, we are, as a combat agency, are continuing to work with medical health professionals right across quite a substantial portion of Western New South Wales to continue to improve our flood response uh, during flood emergencies. So thank you for your time. I'll pass on to Dr. Graham Brewer from the uh, University of Newcastle, who also happens to be an SES uh, volunteer for us down on the Mid North Coast. Uh, over to you, Dr. Brewer. Thank you there, Dave. Yes, indeed. Uh, SES and um, particularly focused on uh, issues of flood intelligence and community resilience, which is also my area of uh, research. A um, little bit of more about me from 2015 to 2019. I worked with the United Nations to set up uh, the CFAL Newcastle, an international tra training centre uh, hosted at the University of Newcastle with a focus on disaster resilience and uh, disaster risk reduction. We also have uh, programmes there devoted to that as well, postgraduate programmes, uh, which I uh, designed and deliver uh, in part with my colleagues now. Um, a little bit about the background to my presentation. Um, as part of that program, some of our students look for real world problems to work on in their uh, research courses. And um, in 2021, end of 21, beginning of 2022, um, Katie, Sewell uh, put me in touch with Gunadar Family Support, uh, which as you probably be aware is um, a community uh, NGO working to support the disadvantaged in Gunadar and the surrounding area. Um, they'd carried out a survey uh, post the November 2021 flood event um, and basically they were asking in a qualitative way for affected community members to give a sense of what they had um, hoped for or expected prior to the event, uh, what they experienced during the event and after the event and how they would like to see things changed into the future. And three of my students uh, worked on that um, that uh, uh, research, and we put together a report, which I believe might be in the goodie bag. Is that, uh, or maybe not, uh, Ellen? Uh, well, anyway, we can sort that out afterwards. I'll, I can provide you a link to to that. Um, so, uh, moving on, 
I want to give you a slightly different, and I'm, I'm in teacher mode at the moment, so bear with me. We are often uh, tempted to talk about natural disasters um, and sometimes man-made disasters. Um, and clearly the media, the ABC, uh, even, even in agencies themselves connected with disasters, it's, it's an, the instinctive thing to talk about a natural disaster when the hazard that caused it is natural in origin. But in the end, the disaster is simply an event, an extreme event or a series of events that overwhelms the local capacity to cope. And whether that's to do with the community as a whole or particular um, organizations within it, particular institutions within it, or even down to individual firms and people, once they become overwhelmed, they experience a disaster. And the more cumulative that effect, the more likely it is that that disaster will be globally recognized or nationally recognized. But the thing to, import, uh, to, to, to grasp here is that all disasters are human in origin. And that is because for all we like to talk about black swan events, the things that were never foreseen, but after the event seemed quite obvious, it is entirely possible to foresee um, extreme events that will turn into disasters. But for a variety of reasons, we choose not to. And it might be uh, to do with politics, it might be to do with economics, it might be do, to do with psychology, because a lot of people don't want to face up to the possibility that they are, through their actions and their, their, their behaviours, um, actually putting themselves in harm's way. Uh, and if you look at the lovely houses in Collaroy that got, that fell into the sea, Nobody really wants to believe that living on the coast with a fantastic view is um, courting disaster, but of course it is. So disasters are always human in origin and it is because we don't choose to look deeply enough and prepare for what we see that we um, experience these disasters. Disaster risk then is a, 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 a product of the hazard itself, the exposure that we have to it, and our vulnerability to the consequences of that exposure, all of which can be offset by a coping capacity. So disaster sits right at the heart of that equation. Uh, now, when uh, when our students, when my students looked at this data, they accepted that societal capacity to mitigate disasters um, come from uh, adaptive coping and participatory um, behaviours. Um, and depending on um, depending on the uh, extent to which those three could be seen, could be found in the, in, in the environment, um, we would have the capacity to reduce uh, disaster risk. Now, disaster risk reduction is an absolutely central platform for the global community. Uh, 193 countries, including uh, the uh, including Australia, signed up to the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction back in 2015, and it contains priorities and and goals. Um, but fundamentally, DRR is different from disaster management in that it prevents, it should prevent the creation of new disaster risk by whatever actions are occurring within society. Not during a disaster, not immediately after, but right the way through the disaster cycle. 
and we've seen an interpretation of the disaster cycle earlier with Ellen's, um, Ellen's uh, presentation. So we don't want to create new disaster risk anywhere through that cycle. Ideally, we want to remove some of the existing disaster risks. And if we can't remove them altogether, we want to manage uh, what remains. So whatever you are doing in your practices, if it doesn't re reduce the likelihood of a future disaster, then you're not practicing DRR. And in fact, you could argue that you're actually co uh, courting a worse outcome because there is a level of complacency uh, that, well, it's been all right in the past, it'll be all right into the future. Um, can I, can I just interject here as well a, a note about levies. There are only two kinds of flood levy in the world. Those that have been overtopped and those that are going to be overtopped. There is nothing surer than that. Sooner or later, every flood levy will be overtopped and all levy designers understand that. It's not something that uh, the public necessarily uh, like to hear. So communities that have a high coping capacities are generally considered to be resilient. So when we talk about creating community resilience, we're actually looking for that um, adaptation, that coping and um, um, connection. So um, resilience is usually a product of these three uh, activities here. Community resilience then occurs when people feel in control of their own situation, are able to experience coherence in the, 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 their lives by the re-establishment of structure and order through what's going on around about them, and also where they experience heightened social connectedness in their times of need. So control, coherence, connectedness, really important. All of which occurs within this halo of trust where the, the truster accepts that they are in a position of vulnerability because of their exposure to hazard, but they expect competence, integrity and benevolence from those in whom they place their trust. So clearly um, doctors and medical staff are in that position of trust. Uh, one thing you can see, of course, is that uh, community resilience is therefore complex and dynamic. So what do we find? So during, if, if we look at this, this is, this, is, this is the disaster cycle here, really. Um, during the event itself and in the immediate early stages of recovery, um, people expressed um, a certain sense of coherence in their relationships with each other, not necessarily across the whole community, but within sections of the community, um, there was sufficient um, uh, resilience coming out of the, their, connectivity, their connectivity. And some of that was through formal and informal social networks. Uh, but clearly what was found was those that were without good social networks, whether they were formal or informal, family or otherwise, uh, they were at heightened risk of disadvantage. What we also found very definitely was that there, were ev there was evidence of um, unprocessed trauma, which will remain in the community long after um, recovery is deemed to have been completed by insurance companies and uh, agencies. Uh, this can go on for many, many years for some individuals. There was, there was definite criticism around uh, flood messaging, but I think the important thing to take away from this is the issue of um, damage to any organization's reputation if it fails in this area here about living up to its uh, um, its obligations as a trusted organisation. 
So what does that mean for you? In terms of DRR, I think everybody has already talked about these things, um, certainly the first two in, in, in detail in previous presentations. But what you can do, I, th I think this is really important, is the peacetime. What can you as, as medical staff or practice managers or whatever, what can I do in peacetime to reduce the demand during extreme events? Uh, and not just demand, but also, as far as possible, deliver business as usual or get back to that state as quickly as possible. So certainly um, there could be a role for you, I think, and these are just my suggestions and that, that I have nothing to do with medicine, so I could be talking nonsense, but um, certainly um, encouraging people to develop uh, their own uh, mental health awareness, maybe even mental health first aid. I know that at work we have mental health first aiders, trained people within our members of staff who are able to offer that kind of assistance. Um, is it just things like appropriate personal stockpile of essential medicines. That's something that takes the pressure off of SES because they otherwise get stuck with the, the business of transporting medicines, which ultimately are not a surprise to anyone. Um, encourage emergency plan development for vulnerable minorities. We know that cold communities, we know that the disabled, we know that the elderly all suffer disproportionately um, because they're not within the normal template of, of um, normative planning. Uh, we've already talked about coping by triage and referral to other uh, com competent services. Stuff in the business continuity area though, uh, safeguarding your IT services and records. Your system might work fine, in normal circumstances, but what happens if you have a power outage? What happens if you have a power surge? What happens if water threatens the place where your sensitive IT infrastructure is, is uh, located? Um, also workforce planning. Are, um, what are you gonna do if some of your personnel are um, affected their, their families are affected and they need to stay with their, 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 their own people rather than come into work. What happens if the practice is isolated? What happens if you can't provide your normal services by a road because the roads have been cut? So, sorry, I've gone over time here. Um, happy to take questions. I know that all of my panelists are happy to take questions as well. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, please ping me an email. Um, and yeah, hit us with some hard questions, please. Thank you, Graham. That was great. Um, for those who don't know me, um, my name is Phoebe James. I'm Professional Development Officer with the PHN. Um, I'm just facilitating this evening. Um, I did have a question come through earlier for Andrew. Um, you mentioned there are combat agencies designated under M Plan, but what if there is an emergency where there is no designated combat agency? Who is responsible then? Oh, thanks, Phoebe. That's a good question. Um, yeah, so as I said, M-Plan designates combat agencies for specific emergencies, bushfire, it's rural fire service, hazardous materials, fire rescue. A couple of really good examples recently of where we've had emergencies where there wasn't a designated combat agency. I mentioned earlier on the gas emergency in Bathurst. Um, from a point of view of a large event that the, the gas companies had dealt with before that, a thousand properties was a thousand customers was the, the maximum they'd had. We had twenty thousand customers. 
uh, and more recently, uh, everyone may have seen on the news that out at, uh, in the, our far west, which is still in our western region, there's been a, a very large fish kill event. Um, 20 million plus fish uh, floating down the uh, river at Menindi. Um, again, nobody's designated to deal with 20 million dead fish. When there's not a designated combat agency, the responsibility falls to the police and the leak, the LEACON, local emergency operations controller, gets to uh, gets to sort it out for want of a better term. So, yeah, Phoebe, if there's no designated combat agency, the police become the designated combat agency. Oh, well, good. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to throw over to um, Dave just for the comments that have popped up in the chat. Yeah, thanks very much, Phoebe. And uh, just uh, to you, Rob, um, my apologies. I was led to believe there was a doctor in the room. I'll just want to commit to getting back to you tomorrow. I'll have a look at the attendee list and let you know. Um, I'm sorry that neither of your practices, it appears, were invited to that event, but uh, one of our facilitators perhaps suggested that there was a doctor in that in who did attend the event. I'll follow that up offline with you in the morning. Thank you, everyone. It was a wonderful um, set of presentations tonight. So um, thank you to all the presenters for putting so much time and effort into creating this event. And um, don't hesitate to contact us if you have questions or need assistance. Um, if there are no further questions, um, we might close the event, but you can always reach out to us. It was a pleasure to host you tonight. Um, farewell until next time. Stay Sorry, well. Ellen. And yeah. Sorry, Ellen. Um, Tammy has put her hand up. Oh, and I'm yeah. Sure. Sorry, I didn't I see that. Yeah. No, no, it just happened. Tammy, if you're happy to, please unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Um, <laughs> we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, sorry I was late. Um, I had planned on being here and was very excited about the um, yeah, this webinar. So hopefully, um, is this going to be recorded by any chance so I can look yes. back? Oh, yes. fantastic. Um, I only got the end project, uh, the end part and um, of David's um, and Graham's um, information, but just wanted to, especially Rob um, Parsons, one I love you as our local doctor, you're a bit of a champion. Um, but I guess there's, um, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Dr. Parsons. Um, I just wanted to quickly show the shout out to Graham too. Um, you were very ins um, inspirational to me with the project that I'm doing for Gunnada and I read your report and it was, I, I still rave on about the information in your in your report. Um, but Carers New South Wales, um, we're looking at that whole preparedness, um, you know, resilience and recovery aspect of a new project that's happening in, in Gunnada, um, sort of targeted at the aged, vulnerable and the people that care for them. Um, so it's really exciting for Gunnada um, to, you know, because obviously with what's happened, um, there's a real need um, to have some plans in place um, surrounding that. So I just wanted to sort of, yeah, talk about the project and if anyone's interested to know a little bit more, um, you know, I'd be happy to share the info. And Graham, when you were saying about building community resilience and getting that relationship back, um, I ended up taking your advice and we've, we've, you know, with Katie and a heap of other people, we're doing a community safety sausage sizzle day on the 3rd of um, June in Gunnada, which is really exciting. And it's a cross agency collaboration. And I'm so proud of um, Gunnada and, you know, all the community sort of coming together and emergency services. So um, watch this space. I think there's some really great changes um, coming in in this sort of area. So, and again, sorry, I was late. Uh, and Tammy, uh, just if I can just jump in on that a sec. Katie had a, a little sort of graph line of heroism and despair and really quite quite a, a resonant diagram for me because it actually is very very similar to one uh, that we used around 2000 in relation to problem-based learning where where students were being asked to solve problems uh, that there we go that's it same graph even the same 
um, not disaster and reconstruction, but uh, everything else, hero heroism, honeymoon, disillusionment. But the point about it is that the if you look at the level at pre-disaster and the level at reconstruction, it really should be higher than the start because DRR requires building back better, which includes building community resilience, those networks of social, um, social, social strength um, and connectedness. Um, so, in fact, this is a learning journey for everyone. And if it isn't, you don't end up building back better. You build back the same and everything is on the same level. You have your heroism and despair and everything else. And it's just the same as it was before. And we've learned nothing. So learn. I've heard this somewhere much. before, Graham. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> just, I'm just saying, sorry, Phoebe, I've heard this somewhere before. Oh, <laughs> Good man, Mitch Parker. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, I just wanted everyone to know that, um, yes, this session is being recorded um, and all of the presentations and the recording will be put on the Education Library um, on the PHN website. As has been referenced, there will be a um, digital goodie bag sent out to you that has a whole bunch of fun information um again thank you to all of our presenters who have their own nine to five jobs and have gone above and beyond to spend their evening with us let alone setting up the presentations so a huge a huge thank you we really do appreciate it um our fearless leader ellen Seth, for wrangling the crowd um thank you very much um and thank you to you guys for joining us tonight understand that you know your home time is your home time your family time dinner time um if it's a bad day extra work time um but we really do appreciate you spending the evening with us um so look after yourself look after each other and thank you again thank you everyone goodbye thank you Thanks, baby. Thank you, baby.